Uh, my name is Mary Redfern and I'm the curator of the East Asian collections at the Chester Beatty. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome you all today for one of our lunchtime talks. And it's also my great pleasure to welcome Nell Regan and James Hadley, who will be giving the talk today. So today, Nell and James are going to be telling us more about their collaborative publication, A Gap in the Clouds, a new translation of one of Japan's most celebrated poetry anthologies, Agora's 100 Poems by 100 Poems, Poets, the Hyakunin Ishu. I'll say at the outset that copies of this book are available in our online shop, which is shop.chesterbeatty.ie, and I'm sure you'll want to take a look there after the lecture. Nell and James are also both very happy to take questions at the end of their talk, so as usual I'd ask that you put these into the Q&A box below. But firstly, let me briefly introduce our speakers. Nell Regan is a poet and non-fiction writer based in Dublin, with three published collections of poetry, Preparing for Spring, Bound for Home, and One Still Thing. She's also gathered a number of awards and fellowships, including an Arts Council Literature Bursary, a fellowship at the International Writing Programme Iowa, as well as being a Fulbright Scholar at UC Berkeley. In 2017, her biography, Helena Maloney, A Radical Life, was the Irish Independent Book of the Year. She's also published translations of Irish language poetry and collaborations with composer and musician Mary Barnicut, recently launched at eavesdrop.ie. James Hadley is Usher Assistant Professor in Literary Translation at Trinity College Dublin. There he directs Trinity's Master's Degree in Literary Translation in the Trinity Centre for Literary and Cultural Translation. I've had the good fortune to have known James for some time as he completed his PhD in Translation Studies at the University of East Anglia in Norwich, where I was busily studying the Meiji Emperor's Tableware. Since then, James has built a reputation for his theoretical research into indirect translation, or the translation of translations. And next year, I understand he'll be publishing a book on this subject with Routledge. But today, Nell and James are here to draw us into the poetic world of courtly Japan. I'm delighted to have you both with us in this virtual realm, and I'll hand over to you now. Thank you. Thanks so much, Mary. Um, that's a really nice introduction. So. Um, I'm going to uh, start off with a little reading of the of one of the um, poems, and then Nell. Will, so I'm going to read it in Japanese, and Nell will read it in uh, in our translation, and then we'll start talking about uh, the collection. And we're going to let the poems uh, lead the way the whole way through this discussion. Akikaze ni tanabiku kumono taema yori more izuru tsuki no kage no sayake sa. From a gap in the clouds, stretched thin by autumn winds, the moon radiates its brilliance. Okay, so um, maybe you can tell why we chose to uh, start off with that uh, poem because it, it actually uh, lends its oh there we go it lends itself uh, to the title of our book um, so which is the uh, gap in the clouds <clears throat> and as Mary said this is a translation it's the latest translation from uh, the Ogura Chakuni issue which is um, I would say pretty much certainly the most uh, famous collection of poetry in Japan. And uh, it was composed in the, well, composed is a difficult uh, point, but it was uh, collected, <laughs> collated, that's the word, um, in uh, <clears throat> in the, the middle, well, the poems themselves are from the Middle Ages. Um, so from the Heian, no, no, the Nara period, which is uh, kind of 8th, 9th century, right the way up until the Kamakura period, which is a few centuries later than that. And um, it was later uh, collected together, but not in book form to start with. It started off actually as decoration on um, the um, folding screens, the sliding screens on a house in a place called Ogra, and that's why it's called the Ogra. Hyakuni means 100 people, and Ishu means one poem each. It's, I might, yeah, no, it's it's such an extraordinary collection because a lot of the poems are 
incredibly famous. But I think what is for me as a non-Japanese speaker, and I always had an interest in Japanese poetry, it was very influential for me when I was younger. But what is so exciting about the book is just how central it is in Japanese culture. It's on the national curriculum. It appears in manga and anime films. And what I love as well is that the um, uh, it's actually is the basis of a poetic game. So it's like a game of snap where the half of the poem is on each set of cards. And the fact that people in Japan play this kind of at New Year's in homes and tournaments all over the country is quite extraordinary. So it's a really, um, really interesting book. And the other thing which, um, you know, you might see through the Chester Beatty collections, because I know there's images um, in the Chester Beatty from the book, is that all of the major artists, the woodblock artists throughout the ages would have illustrated the book. And it's one of the reasons that we picked um, this beautiful Hokusai print for the cover of the book, which Pat Boren so beautifully designed. And now this actually isn't one of the, the an illustration of one of the poems, but it is a Hokusai print. And he did do a very famous illustration of the books. Um, but there's a lovely, James, I love as well your kind of, because when we picked the book, we were working together in the Trinity Centre for Literary Translation. And as I say, I had always been influenced by Japanese poetry. So we were chatting a lot about that. But you were the one who actually picked this particular book. And I, I loved your story about how it, um, your early relationship with it. Oh, well, uh, yeah. So we, uh, Nell and I had been working together. I think it was about four poems that we worked on. Uh, there were also Japanese poems of the same kind, which is Tanka. And uh, so it came up, this, this collection just came up because I've had a long relationship with it because uh, I was one of those unusual children who just decides to start learning a language for fun, basically. And it happened to be Japanese in my case. And I actually, I was probably about 13 or 14 and I had uh, a collection. I had a, a copy of the Japanese version of this, uh, of these poems and a dictionary, a Japanese dictionary. And I kind of made it my mission to work out what each one of the poems was saying. And I thought, well, they're each very short, so it shouldn't be too difficult. And then uh, I started leafing through my, um, my dictionary and trying to find words and actually there were very very few that I could find so I was really not getting anywhere when it comes to working out what the collection was all about and then only much much later did I realize actually this is classical Japanese and it's a very different story from the Japanese that we might learn today and what was actually in my quite slim dictionary of the time so it kind of sat in my consciousness for quite a number of years uh, throughout my uh, learning Japanese. And then it was just lovely when it came up and I actually knew a poet that could help me to, uh, to um, make it our own in some sense. Mm -hmm. No, and I think it might be a good time to look at another poem. Do you think we'd look at the, which gives a good idea of the background of the poems and also the, um, some of the knotty problems we faced? Okay. I view cherry blossoms in the ancient palace of Nara. Exquisite. Each double layer reveals another inner sanctum. As you say, that's a really great poem for illustrating the situation where most of these poems were written, which was um, geographically quite uh, closely located for almost all of them around Nara and Osaka and Kyoto, which is the uh, um, kind of Kansai region, the kind of western part of Japan now. And at the time it was the, the administrative center of the whole country. So uh, the court was either in Nara, Nara or uh, Kyoto, depending on the, the particular um, poem that you're looking at. And the poets themselves were all drawn from the super elite of the society at the time. And this one illustrates this nice um, 
the relationship with the, the uh, imperial court of the time. Mm -hmm. And also it has this interesting um, play on words, uh, which uh, they're, they're called kake kotoba in this kind of uh, poetry. And in this one, might, yeah. in this one, the play on words is to do with the um, cherry blossoms, the blossoms and the palace. So uh, in Japanese, if you're describing a double layer uh, cherry blossom, you call it a nine, nine layer. <laughs> and in the, um, in the poem, it's talking about the many layers, the eight layers, I think it is, of the court. So it's likening these two things, for their complexity and their beauty, basically. And I think, you know, one of the challenges, I suppose, for any translation project is how do you translate these multi kind of layers of cultural reference of um, linguistic references. Um, how do you bring that into a poem that works in English and that sings in English? And that was always our very much the kind of the focus of the, the project. Um, so I think, you know, when I looked at that, I thought, okay, well, the whole eight layer thing is too complex to bring into a short poem in English. But you're trying to kind of suggest a lot of those double meetings. You mightn't be able to actually convey them fully in English. But if you can at least embed them in some way into the language, um, you might give the reader kind of a, a shadow, I suppose, of, of, of what those those double and triple meanings is. And the other thing I loved about um, that poem was uh, the notion that everybody would have known, do you know, and anyone with any Japanese kind of um, connections would know that how important Nara was, but also that it was one of the most, one of the favorite places to go and view cherry blossoms. Do you know what I mean? Which is a lovely kind of layer of, of interest to the poem. But also, you know, I suppose for me finding out as a poet, just how restricted the world of poetry was in Japan, it was very much a courtly thing. Like you, if you were a lady in waiting or an emperor or a, um, a kind of minister of, of, uh, foreign affairs you would have a poem in this book whereas if there's no way you know the peasants or anyone kind of merchant class would have had poems here um I think what I loved as well there was this incredible courtly world of um intrigue like we did we gave just tiny biogs for all the poets and they're all interrelated like either they worked for the, each other or they were the grandchildren of somebody or the uncle of somebody or the granddaughter or the lover and unfortunately sometimes both but that's another whole story um but you know they span this kind of four centuries or no sorry yeah it is about four centuries and they had these kind of poetic debates but poetry was also really important to your status in court. So you, your status, your kind of reputation might be made or lost on a poem. And it kind of reminds, I suppose, as in an Irish context, maybe we recognise that from the kind of bardic circles. It's very much a similar um, kind of environment. Um, but yeah, it's, I mean, James, you were talking about the kind of the problems of translations. And I know the next poem gives us a sense of that again. The Nano, the Nanawa Lagoon. Oh, our favourite one, the one that yeah, took yeah. forever. <laughs> for yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, let's move on to that one. Naniwa gata, michikaki ashi no, fushi no mamo, awa de kono yo o, sugu shite yo to ya. See the reeds of Nanawa Lagoon, that brief span between each notch. Are you saying we've only been apart that long? Already it's another world. And yeah, no, this was a fascinating poem. I mean, I'm, I'm not joking when I tell you, I'd say there were about 30 different um, kind of versions of it. And oh, we come back to it and back to it. And, Basically, it, it really went to the heart of all the choices that we had to make in the process. Do you know, because Jap classical Japanese has no pronouns. So who's talking in the poems, do you know, is not clear from the originals. But also the, um, the structures of English and Japanese are so different. So Japanese has added all these particles that kind of qualify every part of the sentence. And they, you know, they, they can be very difficult. I mean, James, you might quote what, what the actual... I think you had a great line about that one. It was, um, I, 
I don't know what it can, but um, it was something like the um, the amount of time. So if you were going to do, uh, translate it in a kind of very, very boring way, it would be something like the um, the amount of time that we've been apart is no longer than the space between the nodes on the reeds in Naniwa Lagoon, which I guess is not a massively difficult um, <laughs> Uh, concept to grasp, but um, this of, 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 or in, in, in uh, kind of structure really didn't lend itself well to poetry in English. And as you say, there were all these particles at the end, which um, are used very uh, frequently in classical Japanese, and they can add an, a massive amount of emotional depth to a poem, but there's just something we don't have in English. Mm. So you might just add one particle in Japanese, and then suddenly the whole meaning has changed so that um, the reader knows that you're not just saying um, it is this length of time, but they're saying, oh, is it only that length of time? Or I feel so strongly that it's only that length of time. And it's not just one, but um, several of these particles are kind of lay, layered one on top of each other. So that made it especially fun. Mm. We might actually, James, somebody, I just spotted somebody in the chat saying they'd love to see the translations of the poems on show for longer. So we, we might do that if that was possible. Um, no, and the other, I mean, I suppose it, it goes to the heart of another um, decision we made, which was, or you know, I was trying to think, how can I make these poems direct rather than an explanation? So a lot of the time it was by using rhetorical questions, but also by using the first person. Do you know what I mean? Um, so we might, I'd say, uh, we go on to 97 maybe, and we will, we'll leave it longer on the screen. Thank you for that. We can talk over them anyway. <laughs> In the cool of the night, I wait on Matsuo Beach for you. Like scorched seaweed salt, I burn for you, but you do not come. That's a great example of one where we, we had to um, make the choice about who's speaking to whom and uh, as you say with with a uh, kind of very minimal use of pronouns or really kind of implied pronouns in Japanese or in classical Japanese anyway um, it could in many cases it could be not I talk to you but it could be she talks to him or he talks to her or even they talk to another group of them <laughs> But uh, I remember this discussion that we had now where we, we kind of decided that we wanted to make the poems as immediate as possible. And the way that we could do that was to, um, was to decide that we would, uh, wherever possible, talk about I and you. Yeah, yeah. The, no, and it's very much, um, the other thing I love about this poem is this, it really shows you the kind of the type of passion and the kind of the, you know, so many of the poems are about love and longing and loneliness and um, they really speak to now. And I think that's one of the extraordinary things about this collection. Um, but the other thing is this is actually written by the, the guy who compiled the collection and he was really influential as a critic and an editor. Um, and again, a lot of the kind of other poets in it might have been his students or he might have mentored or they might have been his lover. So again, you can really see the kind of interrelation in the court. But again, I think the other thing that we we spent a lot of time on and is, is kind of a real knotty problem for um, translators and particularly in short poems is how on earth to kind of translate the cultural references. So there's a really, this is, talks about um, making salt in ancient Japan, which involved burning seaweed and using the, the ashes. And so you had sort of seaweed salt. So it was, how do you try and convey all of that in a short amount of poem? And so much of our translation process was about sinking into the physicality of it. 
like how how does the seaweed salt get burnt and what does it end up like and how does this kind of relate to desire and somebody sitting on a beach and and you know I think it, it's really interesting that these poems are kind of there's huge amounts of glosses and stories and phenomenal amounts of versions of them but I think we always try to come back to the original do you know what I mean? And as much as we could access it, certainly I was accessing it kind of through James and through the questions I'd normally ask. I'd be saying, yeah, but where does it say that or what says that? Um, but a lot of the, the cultural references we actually had to kind of jettison because you can't um, you can't put everything in. And if they take away from the English version, you know, we often had to make very kind of difficult decisions about what to leave in and, and what to take out. That's true. But it was it was actually it's amazing now that I look at the collection at how many we actually managed to include. And it was mm -hmm. really for me to be able to basically write notes about everything mm -hmm. uh, for, for Nell. And then we discuss it and then uh, watch th those notes turn into a poem when she was uh, really when she started to inhabit the poem, the yeah, the poem. Mm -hmm. No, it's um, sorry. Go on. It's the same thing about uh, named named places as well. They, they exist in quite a few of the poems, and some of the names are really quite long. Like in this one, it's got Matsu Beach. Fair enough, but uh, in some of the others, it's it's fairly maybe obscure places uh, mm -hmm. with long names, and that was also a difficult thing for us to work out. Well, is this place name key? To the to the poem itself, or or is it mentioned? Like, would it mean anything to a reader in English? Yeah, and I think for me as a poet, again, somebody who doesn't have Japanese and certainly wouldn't have an academic kind of background in Japanese, like for me, the key was if it worked as a poem in English. Do you know what I mean? You don't need to um, to come to this as somebody with with necessarily with an interest in in the background or the versions or anything to do with the history of it does it work as a collection in English and I suppose that's what I was always working towards with my versions and I think they've been so influential in the history of literature in English I think it's a really important thing to say in that I would have been very influenced by versions of Japanese poetry by Kenneth Rexroth American poets and Jane Hirschfield and you know I think that what's wonderful about these is you're translating poetry and poetry is universal themes of poetry are universal that last and you're translating something that has lasted in one culture and I suppose you're trying to kind of bring it into another culture and translation has that lovely bridge I mean it's it's like an infusion of kind of images and histories in from one language in into another and it's always imperfect do you know what I mean but it's it's also something that's kind of quite exciting to do and and do you know we're delighted with the kind of the design of the book and the sort of feel of it as well I think um but the other the, I suppose the, the other poem that we might talk about is poem nine which is one of the most famous poems in the book by one of the most famous poets um okay Hana no iro wa utsuri ni kerina itazura ni Wagami on Huru Nagame Seshimani. What use your bright petals now? They fade in this relentless rain, just as I have, gazing out at this life. And I mean, this poem is by one of the most famous um, classical Japanese poets, Ono no Komachi, Komachi, I've never pronounced it properly, apologies. Um, but she was she was kind of the subject of many um, no plays that were written about her. And what's really interesting about the collection is that I think it's about a fifth of the collection or um, the poems are written by women. And they were very, they were some of the leading kind of Japanese poets at the time and um, prose writers as well. And it really, again, it's that lovely, extraordinary sense. And it's such a relevant one for now because it's, um, you know, the kind of fading of spring flowers and the author is looking out. But again, the kind of, there's so many complexities in the original, which, you know, again, you can kind of only maybe hint at in, in our version. But um, she, again, was an extraordinary woman and she was actually the granddaughter of poet, 
the poet of poem 11 um, and was also included in many of the kind of was seen as one of the immortal six poets, you know, of, of Japanese poetry. Um, the other I might just read, we don't have it up on the screen, but I might just read another spring one. Um, if I can find it which has the same, uh, yeah, I love this one as well. And it's so relevant now because the cherry blossoms are just starting to fall. And it's poem 33. In the long light of spring, my own heart settles. I marvel at how petals fall, such unrest. And you can really see with kind of all of these poems, just how much is, is being packed into kind of five lines and they're, the poems themselves were actually called tanka or waka, which actually means short poem. And you, if anyone's familiar with the haiku, they're like a five line version of a haiku. Um, but in Japanese, James, you might want to talk about, you know, we see them as syllables, but they're actually called something else, I think. Yeah, they're called uh, mura in Japanese. So it's, it's, one, um, it's one Japanese letter, which normally, uh, normally consists of either a vowel or a vowel and a consonant or just the, the letter N. And uh, so they count they count these uh, more, as you might uh, pluralize them in English. And uh, so each line, it's not actually a line in Japanese. You most often see the whole thing represented as on one line, but the number of uh, mora in each component uh, is the is the kind of rule that defines the tanka, but uh, but Nell, we we actually decided in this case that we would stick with the five line mm. translation, didn't we? Mm. Yeah, and I think it was very important. I think I suppose that was something I was aware of that there's a poetically there's kind of attention in odd numbered lines. Do you know in in English like you have your if you have a um, a couplet or a line with, uh, sorry, a verse with four lines in it. It's a very complete thing in English, whereas the there's a real tension in, in five lines, and I think it really reflects the kind of the the open ended nature of a lot of, of Japanese poetry, mm. and also the subtlety of it, where so much is left unsaid. Um, yeah, they are. They are. I like to think about them as kind of mental snapshots on a scene. Yeah. So it's yeah. often a physical scene, like a picture of cherry blossoms or something. But uh, behind that is the reaction of the, the the emotional reaction of the poet. And actually, I might just mention that in this one, this is actually one of the ones where um, who is doing what to whom is more clearly defined in in uh, Japanese. But that the way that they describe uh, me, so the way that they express me and you uh, is very oblique. So instead of saying just me, they say, well, they say me actually, M-I, which literally means uh, body, like my body. And the way that they say you or someone else is yo, which is literally the world. And that's, that's kind of what's happening in this poem. So there's also uh, this um, juxtaposition between whether the, the poet is talking specifically about their physical body or just themselves, and whether they're addressing the world or whether they're addressing some specific person. Uh, but I think the way that uh, we managed to render this into English actually does capture some part of that. You know, and I think that was so much of the challenge, like I would take away all of this kind of information and sort of, um, and again, as I say, like the, the kind of the main thing was always to make a poem that would work in English and that would render some of those complexities, but kind of being aware with translation that you're always having to make sacrifices. Um, and I suppose the other thing then, because we worked, the way we worked was we'd meet up maybe every two weeks and we'd look at some of the poems and I'd bring back versions. We'd, we'd have chatted about them. But the other thing I really wanted to try and get access to was the sound of the poems because they have this extraordinary vowel music. And, um, you know, I would get James to write out kind of the sounds of them as well. And that would allow me to maybe try and echo some of that in English. Do you know, again, you couldn't 
replicate it because it wouldn't sound right in English, but you might try and have a kind of um, like fade, rain, have, gaze, you know, working through the poem that you're maybe not necessarily aware of, but it's doing something kind of for your ear, you know. Yeah, that was the magic that I, I was constantly astounded by how you work now because I would I would see the text for the, um, the kind of Japanese history and the culture and all that stuff. And then Nell would come out with uh, with basically word music. It was amazing to watch. Mm. Um, I think we may have that poem on, on one of the slides, the one that you just read, but I'm not sure. So should we go no, on to the No, slide? let's go on to the next one. No. <laughs> and I think um, actually what's lovely about the next one we're going to look at is it just, it really underlines the universality and just how many of the poems, what was extraordinary was we'd begun this before the pandemic, but next thing the pandemic hits, our publication schedules are like, do you know, publisher was saying like, nobody knows what's going to happen between Brexit, pandemics, distribution. And I really would like to pay tribute actually to Pat Boren, who kind of kept the show on the road of Daedalus and produced this beautiful book um, with the calligraphy, which um, we might talk about as well. James, the, the can't really see it there. Um, but but suddenly the book came out in February and the amount, I, I just found it extraordinary, the reaction from people. People were saying it was like a daily vitamin pill or a lot of the poems seem to speak to the pandemic. And James, I know you chose this one in particular for that. And um, so we might we might go for that one. Yeah, I hope it's the right one now. Nagekitsu, hitori nuru yo no akuruma wa ika ni hisashiki Nights I sleep alone, breathing till the sky lightens. How much longer will this go on? And I think if ever there was a pandemic poem, that's one of them. <laughs> I'm so glad it worked out correctly. Uh, um, but yes, absolutely. That was uh, when we were actually planning this talk. I, I, my, I just opened the book and my eye happened to fall on that one. And I thought, that's just perfect for the, the pandemic. Yeah. It just encapsulates yeah. so many people's feelings. Yeah. And I think that's why these poems have lasted. Do you know what I mean? Because I think that they're, they're universal and they talk about love and loneliness and loss. And no matter the fact that they were written a thousand years ago by Japanese kind of ladies in waiting and emperors, they speak to now. And I think that's that's why they've lasted. Um, and yeah, as I say, no, I, who said somebody else said to me it was like getting a daily vitamin and they just take one a day. But somebody else said to me, lovely, she said it's like a box of chocolates. You just take one a day. And I thought, what a lovely um reaction to the book do you know it's it's been very very lovely um that was another thing that was facilitated by pat actually because the size yeah. of the book he was very very clever in thinking well mm. people might might read one of the poems and then put the book in their pocket and go on the yeah. train or something yeah and yeah oh so the size that it is really yeah. helps helps you to do that and the calligraphy, James, you chose the calligraphy. Do you want to say a word about that, which is we've seen up on the screen, but it's also in the book? That's right. It's the same yeah. poetry, same calligraphy yeah. that you see in the book. And it was uh, <clears throat> it was um, taken from what, the first print uh, edition of the Ogura Hyakuni issue, which I could find. Uh, it was uh, the book was um, published in 1680. So still quite some time after the poems were originally um, written and, and quite a long time after the collection was um, brought together. But it was, uh, the book is actually um, a very early kind of uh, woodblock um, by uh, Hishikawa Moronobu, who became very, very influential in um, what would later become ukiyo-e uh, woodblock printing, which is, um, I'm sure I don't need to tell you, very, very, very important for Japanese printing. So that's um, the same kind of printing that um, you see in Hokusai and, and these really famous um, prints. But he was really one of the trailblazers. So this book itself, well, the, the, um, the calligraphy that we're seeing in our book, um, kind of draws a link to that, that really old tradition. I love that. Do you know, the other thing was, I think we chose A Gap in the Clouds as the title poem. I think, again, just to give that sense of hope, because it was really when things were looking grim. 
But I just we were talking about this and we thought we might actually end up on a po positive note as well. And um, there's an exquisite poem um, which is full of these moments and gems. The book is. And um, I like this one because hopefully the next few months is going to see us all released a little bit. <laughs> we <laughs> and then actually there'll be time for q and I think after. Um, Wata no hara, yasoshima kakete, kogi ide nuto, hito ni wa suge yo ama no tsuribune. The fishermen salute as they row out, bound for the sea's wide expanse, its scatter of islands. Thank you. Well, thank you both so much for a really lovely, lively, and as you say, just poetry is so incredibly resonant and these poems particularly have carried through the centuries across seas, across countries, and yeah, speak to us all today and have been speaking to many of the people in the comments there as well.